Hey, Next Economy Now listeners. We're so excited to share with you that we've officially opened registration for our fall cohort of the Next Economy MBA, which begins on September 17th. Our team created this course for listeners like you, the entrepreneurs, artists, community leaders, and other folks on the front lines of the Next Economy movement. Based on our 15 years of experience working with 300 different social enterprises, our nine-month facilitated cohort will provide you with a supportive co-learning community. Together, we'll explore the pitfalls of the business-as-usual economy, explore key business principles from a regenerative and just perspective, all while fostering the community and connection we need to stay resilient, inspired, and motivated in our movement for global change. If this sounds like it might be useful for you or a member of your community, we invite you to join us for one of our upcoming indoor sessions on June 11th, July 23rd, August 8th, or August 20th. Plus, you can save 20% when you register for the course before July 29th. Get started at lifteconomy.com forward slash MBA. Thanks for listening. And now on to the show. Welcome to Next Economy Now. The goal of this podcast series is to highlight the leaders who are taking a regenerative, bioregional, equitable, democratic, racially just, and whole systems approach to creating the new economy. Welcome. My name is Erin Axelrod. I'm a partner at Lyft Economy, and I am so pleased to be joined today by two amazing people behind the Agrarian Trust. I am joined today by Ian McSweeney, who has had a career and life work focused on the human connection to soil and food. He's worked as a social worker, founded a brokerage and consulting company to focus on prioritizing conservation, agriculture, and community. And most recently, he served as executive director of the Russell Foundation, where he worked with 60 land conservation groups, townships, local, state, and federal partners to move 60 farms and protect over 12,000 acres and raising 16 million, all aimed towards providing benefit to farmland, farmers, communities, and the local agrarian economy. And he is now the director at Agrarian Trust. Now, Eliza's work with Agrarian Trust is specifically focused on land-based livelihoods, healthy farms, decommodifying land, and legal tools for equitable land access and shared stewardship. Eliza Spellman-Taylor lives in Southwest Virginia, where she cooperates a diversified farm in the Sinking Creek Valley called Singing Spring Farm, where she raises food, fiber, and medicine, and specializes in raw milk goat cheeses. She's a farmer, acupuncturist, and agrarian trust team member, and her life centers on nurturing and healing with the land and human communities that depend on it and especially focusing on healing the racialized harms and capitalism. She holds a bachelor's degree and a JD from Vermont Law School and a master's degree from the Zhengtao School of Classical Chinese Medicine. Thank you both so much for joining us to tell us about Agrarian Trust. We're so happy to have you. Yeah, thank you, Erin. I'm excited for our talk. So could you tell us about how this idea of the Agrarian Trust started and a little bit about what is so, Matt, incredibly important about the work you do? Yeah, so Agrarian Trust started kind of brought together by a few organizations, Greenhorns National Young Farmers Coalition, Schumacher Center, and others came together for discussions. And they they realized and came to the conclusion that really a land trust that's focused on community land trust structures and has a priority on farmland and regenerative agriculture was needed. And there was a lack of capacity or other organizations holding that role. And there still is in many ways. We need a thousand more organizations doing this work. But you know, they, they came together to start the Agrarian Trust. The Agrarian Trust then 
kind of had a few years of developing as an organization and getting off the ground and really was founded with three mission areas. One was to raise awareness for the transition of farmland that's underway, that upwards of 400 million acres is in transition right now in this country because of the demographics of landowners. And two, to support stakeholders and communities. So, you know, developing networks, incubating projects, supporting initiatives all around that land transition and others who are doing this work and connected to the work in community. How can we support and be part of those stakeholder networks? And three and final really is to create this land holding structure. And, and so knowing that this type of land trust was needed was why the trust was formed knowing it was part of the work of creating the land trust structure you know it had this three-part mission and the third part mission we've now created into this agrarian commons model that we launched a year and a half ago now uh, and we'll talk more about it today i'm sure and eliza as a farmer involved in this do you have a personal story or calling that that really compelled you to get into land decommodification and, and commons yeah, I guess I just generally love connecting with people in relation with land and food. I'm drawn to gardening as a nexus between people and nature, and I deeply care about environmental health and human health. And a passion, I guess, for supporting our collective liberation through human relationships with each other, the land, and all beings. And I think agrarian commons is just inherently about relationships with communities, land, people, farmers, and how all of, you know, those move and support um, a healthy system. So Amazing. So share a little bit about, I think what's so critical for our listeners to understand is how the common structure is unique and additive for this just food system that we're aspiring to create. Could you talk a little bit about the relationship between agrarian trust and agrarian commons? Yeah, so really, so we, Agrarian Trust as an organization, saw places and resources and ways that we could and should be involved, and also saw ways that in kind of decisions and where control, equity, and autonomy should sit as also holding a place in local communities. So, you know, what we saw was the need to create a multi-entity structure that accounted for kind of what a national grassroots nonprofit can bring in supports and what a local community can bring in supports and how they together can collaborate towards a shared goal. So this the relationship between the commons and the trust is is that the relation you know that the commons are focused on the human relationship the land holding the uh, human land relationship where the trust is more focused on how can we bring network supports knowledge uh, examples of learning and and kind of modeling that we're doing elsewhere and resources of different types forward to these commons. Yeah, I think in a way it like mimics nature in a sense that things don't stagnate in some centralized nonprofit way where, you know, whether that's like wealth accumulation by a large national nonprofit, you know, agrarian trust is moving money and supporting local communities, you know, at where all of the land is held locally, assets are held locally, money moves from the nonprofit to local communities. And so there's like very different than a centralized bureaucracy or something along those lines. Yeah. So, and you launched in 10 strategic geographies. So could you talk a little bit about those different places that in the, the stories of, of some of, some of the exciting land rematriation things that have happened so far? Yeah. Happy to. We, Eliza and I, and a few others, as we kind of developed this agrarian commons model, you know, we, we developed the structure and the model with many others. And at the same time, we as a very small organization at the time were cultivating a number of relationships and projects. And those projects were 
you know, thoughts of and intentions around creating these community centered agrarian commons. So we had different kind of long standing relationships in some places and, you know, other areas, thoughts of kind of the types of community connection or collaborations that could come about to create these commons. And looking at all those, uh, we had intention of trying to create a model, the agrarian commons, that has some shared values and structure and similarities, and also is unique to place. And its uniqueness from place to place is, you know, led by local community and those involved, and also tells kind of stories of of America and communities across the country that are so diverse and in present times are so polarized and yet are connected to land and are connected to food and can resonate with this commons model. So how can we kind of use this model, the agrarian commons that is fairly similar and find communities that, that show the diversity of how and where this model can be helpful for land transitions and kind of fruitful for community engagement. And so, you know, thought of and developed and launched the commons where we did since then are, are getting a lot of interest of people, you know, wanting to from learn about what we're doing and kind of have questions of their own to wanting to start or participate or support a growing commons that that exists that we have a lot more kind of opportunities and needs now to also think about. So we continue to kind of strategically think about how do we tell, you know, very impactful, rich and important localized stories that are connected to national values and interconnected to one another in a way that shows this commons can work for farms at all different kind of ages of the farm business for you know, farmers seeking land to land seeking farmers, that it's really a, it's a fit in many ways depending upon the community needs. Yeah, I think a big part of the vision in the diversity of the first cohort, I suppose, of commons and future commons is polycultural commons all over the U.S. with diverse partners and land trusts involved, supporting each other through, you know, like mutual aid, mycelial networks. So a big question we're working from and always evolving is how to design agrarian commons, support other land commons and grow supporters and allies in the same way we'd nurture a diversified farm or, you know, a farm grounded in agroecology. Is there, I was really excited with the the one in Maine that launched. Is, are there, can we get a snapshot of just a couple that are, so people can actually really witness and, and envision, okay, who are these people that are gaining access to land that they didn't have tenure over, you know, before agrarian trust and agrarian commons came onto the stage? Yeah, so a real kind of diversity, you know, and it's not, it's not always about, you know, who is gaining access. Some have access and continue that access in a new way, but really kind of what's transpired since the incorporation of these agrarian commons and the kind of exploration and development of, of other emerging initiatives is we've moved forward and, and kind of landed four commons with farm properties. And so thinking about those four and their rich stories, there's right in Maine, there's the Somali Bantu community in the Lewiston Auburn area. And we, we and almost 1,800 donors came together from around the country to raise money to acquire a 104 acre farm that they now have tenure on. They, they've added high tunnels, a processing and slaughter uh, space that's halal certified. They have cold storage there. They're just fully farming on the land, vegetables and goats presently and expanding the acres in kind of cover crop and cultivation. And, and so that's a growing farm community there. And they, the Somali Bantus, were having a nonprofit farm organization that was land insecure for a number of years. So that commons addressed a land security and is now building land equity and they're they're some of the food they're growing, they're developing markets for, you know, they're expanding their other programmatic work and their community engagement in many ways. So that's, you know, growing and a wonderful example there. 
in Washington state, we had been donated some land from a non-farmer who envisioned the land being it being an act of agriculture, but it was a hay field, a former lavender farm years ago. But that land we've held, we've through partnership with Patagonia and others, we've invested in stewardship to build soil health and restore some NATO ecosystem that's there. And, and we've now just gone through an RFP process and selected a, a hopeful first next generation farmer to, to hold a secure long term lease for that property. And so, you know, stay tuned over the next month or two, we'll, we'll announce out who that is, but we're excited to kind of bring that land into relationship with the next generation and bring that land into active agriculture. In New Hampshire, we partnered with a community land trust that has a long history of ties to the community land trust movement and the Schumacher Center and other early kind of European-led CSA farms. And transferred, they donated farm in and transferred farm into the New Hampshire Grain Commons. It's a mid-career regenerative livestock farm that provides local and regional to proteins from wholesale to retail to on-farm and CSA pickup. And is building soil uh, along this major river, the Merrimack River, and in the state, less than 10 minutes from the airport in the largest city in New Hampshire. So that's that's kind of a different story of you know who the farmers are connected and what the work is, but that's going on in New Hampshire. And and then kind of the the last most recent land project would be we're involved in a rematriation project in Massachusetts that is has been more of a direct relationship building project, but a significant fundraise as well. And we just on November 18th of this year acquired that property into this new ownership structure and are now beginning to have work days and develop lease and, and decision making process and take the steps forward to improve and renovate the property and a few repairs needed to the homes there. But it's transitioning back to indigenous ownership after 386 years from which they were removed from that exact land. And it's a beautiful land. It has a, along a river, it has a five acre island. It's an active farm. It's, it's got housing for many. So yeah, the future there and what will be is really exciting and inspiring and stay tuned to hear more about that. And there's more work to come, but that, that's kind of a snapshot of what's been going on with the land projects. Thank you so much for doing that work to, you know, repair those relationships and those harms. I'm curious if you would, would talk a little bit about, you know, kind of the elephant in the room of land ownership in the, in this country, particularly along the racial wealth divides and the ownership divides and, you know, how you hold that in the context of, of trying to repair that. Would it make sense to share a little bit about the Central Virginia Agrarian Commons? This commons recently launched. Yeah, and even just, I mean, I think some of our listeners might not even know that I think it's like 1% of land in this country. Less than 1% is owned by African Americans and, you know, I'm sh- indigenous land tenure probably has some similar statistics. So less than 2% of farmland is owned by people of color and over 70% of farmers, farm workers are people of color. Yeah. So it's so grossly unjust that ownership and hoarding and, and, you know, who has ownership, who has tenure, who has equity in land and who doesn't and who's excluded from that. The reality is also though, that that same unjust system and the hoarding of assets is in this transition where 400 million acres of that asset is in transition this decade and next. So different than many other institutions and systems and problems were faced in our society and across the globe, like this is a problem that's in a transition period now. So it's more we have the opportunity and and the responsibility and obligation as coming from and being part of the white landowning class to move transition during this time of land transition into a more just ownership and equitable structure because the change is happening daily that you know there's usda noted from 2012 to 2017 that 37 mid-sized farms 
closed every single day. So every single day, 37 mid-sized farms were closing. Every year, over 30,000 acres is stolen still from black farmers across this country, from land theft and heirs' property rights and other schemes that steal land today, this year, from black farmers. So, you know, that transition is underway in, in many ways, right? So, so what are we going to do to step into this land transition and take concrete action to, to make permanent change? Yeah, and our agrarian common model is actually, you know, quite borrowed from new communities in Georgia, you know, deeply rooted in the South and African American farmers. And I think that that really resonates too with the Central Virginia Agrarian Commons, which is a black led commons that has an interest in both rural land and urban land and is taking in a donation outside of Richmond, the former capital of the Confederacy in Virginia, a land donation from a, a white couple um, that are really interested in having black and indigenous people of color centered in agriculture on the land and building equity on the land and stewarding the land exclusively. So I think too the agrarian commons can really offer a complementary model where reparations is maybe a real power shift, but a lot of communities are really interested in not mimicking the same, you know, white settler personal property model that we've had in this country <laughs> since its beginning, but instead creating a new way of decommodifying land and holding land in community. And that's really attractive to people who don't want to replicate the harms that have been done through commodifying the, the whole world, people and land. That was an amazing story you just shared, Eliza. And I'm curious, what is next for agrarian trust? Like, how do these commons grow? Are you receiving lots of interest in people donating land? How, you know, what, what's next for agrarian trust and agrarian commons? So a combination of things. Eh? Yeah, we're, we're seeing a huge amount of interest of, of people wanting to engage in different ways. Some of that is, you know, is their land project a good fit? And some of those are donations. Some of those want to sell or transfer, you know, in some term agreement. But there's a generally more kind of interest coming towards us right now than we have capacity for. So part is... You know, we're, we're doing some internal work now. We've been growing considerably from very small organization just a few years ago with a few of us to now 11 and, and growing. So, you know, the need to look, focus and attend inward is also part of what's next for us. But for the, the agrarian comments that, yeah, we have exciting work coming in Virginia this year. We have exciting work in other agrarian commons to stay tuned for. But the other piece is that it's land, it's access to capital, it's also knowledge and access to and participation in these systems that hold land and hold capital and hold knowledge of such, whether it be legal or land trust or conservation or other. So how do we support and build capacity and share awareness for that. So we've been developing and, and have recently uh, two new people have joined the team and will be launching in the coming year a Commons Alliance and a Commons Alliance being kind of a, in majority, a, an outward facing kind of support and network connection and resource to help share knowledge and help share our learning and what we're inspired by and what we're creating for, for others to learn from, pick apart, critique, evolve into their own structure that, you know, how can we share the knowledge of kind of the structure we've created, the knowledge of how we, we can fundraise and as I mentioned in Maine, you know, raise money from people across the world from 1800 donors to this rematriation project where we're closing in on $2 million in a few short months. So, you know, how can we share the process we do with others and how can we support and learn from and evolve through the process others take? So, so how do we get in, you know, 
deeper relationship with each other and this land transition process. And that'll be a lot of the work of this Commons Alliance that's coming forward. And it's more to connect with and help building the field in general of knowledge share and other organizations work and capacity and how we might interconnect with and work with them in many ways. Because, you know, our goal of growing these commons is one farm at a time. And even donations require money for the transaction and our stewardship endowment we set up and investments we may need to make in buildings or land or, or other. So it, it's a process of relationships and land transition for us that takes time. And each one is important to focus in that way. So that's part of our work, but that's only going to be at most, uh, you know, little inspirations across the country of these commons. But how can we connect and engage with many others, too? Yeah, we're experimenting and this is just the beginning and we need to document and share our work with others and encourage and support all kinds of shared land stewardship projects. because We need, like Ian said earlier, thousands of these. Thanks for that. And it occurs to me that Something that I've found really compelling and interesting about the model is how it addresses what we call in our MBA program the price parity paradox. How food growers in this country, when they get into a, you know, interfacing with the economic system and they're trying to grow food and deliver it to market, the economics, the way our, our food system economics work, really forces farmers oftentimes to compromise. And so I'm curious if you could share a little bit about how having farmers have 99-year leases or, or some form of stable land tenure can facilitate them in doing more practices that are good for people and planet and, and good for communities rather than kind of what we see farmers being kind of trapped in this system that forces them to make other decisions. Yeah, I suppose first... The commons, you know, takes the mortgage that might be based on the market value of land or the development value of land out of the question or the equation for a farmer to calculate and, you know, what's possible. And a lot because agrarian trust is a nonprofit and can move money into agrarian commons and agrarian commons themselves can also fundraise for projects, things like planting an orchard or an agroforestry system or things that might take years to develop that a farmer that has a bottom line or needs to earn an income from year season one wouldn't necessarily be able to afford or have the time to afford. And so, yeah, a model where that we're leveraging capital to move into land itself and into communities to layer into or intersect with a farm business is really important. Amazing. Thanks for helping our listeners kind of understand that correlation. Do you have anything to add, Ian? Yeah. We'll see too, right? Because this is so new for us. So we're taking in farms now and some are just bringing on next farmer and business is starting. Others are mid-career business, but you know we don't have the answers. So we're not going to for decades out, right? Hopefully. We need to be okay with that. We need to be okay with that in our culture and kind of take these bold steps to step forward with intention. I think part of it too is the shift in mindset. Like the reality is now farmland is owned by people who are on average 64 or older. So the time horizon for that ownership before a transition takes place is short term. And we have all this 400 million acres in transition. Like the farmland is, is a, you know, faster and faster trading commodity. Unfortunately, we need to think about farmland in a different relationship and a different value system. And so hopefully we won't know for several decades or more, but hopefully a nonprofit ownership structure that decommodifies the land and a 99 year lease that frees the farmer up from that debt burden, but also gives security and ability to build equity and lays out some shared stewardship and management of that land. Like hopefully that does make a difference and, and it changes perspective enough that people 
you know, will invest and will steward and and kind of practice agriculture on land in ways that regenerates the earth in so many ways that are needed. But we won't know for several decades or more. But, you know, we know the direction we're going in over the next few decades. And we really need to do all we can to try to create and manifest alternatives. Yeah, because certainly what's happening right now is not working. <laughs> right? <laughs> Bill Gates buying up all the farmland and being the sole decision maker over it is maybe not the best way to have um, more shared resource in this in this world. Yeah, the commons are really like creating spaces within a world that we can't or a system that we can't fully step out of. But hopefully there are spaces that include all these diverse worlds that we really want to live in. And ultimately, they can expand and create even more possibilities. Maybe that's a theory of change for agrarian trust or one of our theories of change. Yeah, it reminds me of that quote from from the Zapatista movement of like the world within worlds, a, a world of many worlds. I love that. So in our last few moments here, how can our listeners both support agrarian trust and agrarian commons and also just develop more literacy and competencies to talk about some of these entrenched issues that are kind of like below the surface. They're not so much how most people talk about the problems of our worlds, but they're so your your analysis of what we need to do to change the systems is is so important. Well, yeah, you know, go to our website, agrariantrust.org. Go to the Learn tab, the Agrarian Commons or the Commons Alliance tabs. All are a wealth of information on kind of different aspects of our work and partners' work and resources available. There's also a calendar there on the website that shares other presentations that we're doing and workshops. So you can follow us elsewhere. Some of that Commons Alliance work is is uh, regional workshops around land transfer, land ownership, land tenure, land relationship structures that we're partnering with other organizations. In the Northeast, we partnered with Northeast Farmers of Color, had a workshop series where several hundred attendees came to watch, you know, online, making it very accessible to many. So, you know, tune in and see where we're giving other presentations. But then we're we're a nonprofit organization who needs to raise philanthropic capital to operate. We're also bringing forward this model, which is focused on transitioning land, farmland, from the commoditized marketplace into a community-centered commons. So that takes considerable money from you know a, an acquisition of land and the project costs and investment needs to landowners who are willing and able and hold vision and or donate land still needs those other project investment costs. So, you know, the need for philanthropic capital of all types to make these land transitions locally in communities across the country is really where the majority of our needs are and will continue to be for the years ahead. And, you know, in, encourage you to also think about, you know, any other and especially BIPOC led land trust and, and kind of land owning communities that it's the same challenge they face is land transitions and acquisitions have a considerable cost and they're excluded from these systems of capital and the networks of accessing capital many times. So, you know, support us, but please look for other organizations uh, that are BIPOC led and support them and understand the costs of land transitions and support them in meaningful ways to make those land transitions possible. Amazing. Well said. So this holiday, donate to your local BIPOC led uh, land trust and, and uh, land you know folks and think of agrarian trust as well. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And then just like any other resources, where are you looking to get your information about what's happening in farmland? Like when you're looking outside of a grand trust, like whose blogs are you reading or things like that? Well, on one level, I'm not at all. And I'm getting such a rich knowledge base and experience. Like we're working in 11 states localized to, you know, individual farms and these communities connected to them. 
around the country and each one is so diverse. So just to be part of those board meetings and part of the meetings and kind of dive into and learn from the realities and local communities across the country is such an inspirational gift. Land collectives like Earthseed and others throughout the country that are really modeling new ways of collectively stewarding land are really inspiring too. But definitely, like Ian said, the people and places we're working with are the ultimate. Thank you so much. We're going to close now. And I so appreciate your work. Thanks for being on the show. Thank you. Thank you. Next Economy Now is a production of Lyft Economy. To listen to all of our episodes, go to lifteconomy.com slash podcast. That's L-I-F-T economy.com slash podcast. You can also sign up for our monthly newsletter at lifteconomy.com slash newsletter. Please also rate and review our podcast on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks for listening.